Have a seat on your porcelain throne. It's time to talk some shit on the Powell Movement. Welcome to the Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and this week I want to talk about podcasts. I don't listen to that many. The ones I like are Crime and Sports and the Dopey Podcast. I recommend Crime and Sports to everyone, and I recommend Dopey to weird people like me who aren't hardcore drug addicts and have never been one, but love hearing the sad and funny stories around addiction. This podcast is so real that it started with two hosts, and around episode 142, one of the hosts relapses and dies. Which really sucks because he was so awesome, and really, the podcast went from a 10 to a seven when he died, so I don't even listen that much anymore. Personally, I try to stay away from interview-based podcasts because that's what I do, and I don't need or want to bite anyone else's style. Actually, I'd never do that, so I guess I don't need to listen to other interview podcasts because I don't want to steal questions or who knows. And now I know what sets my podcast apart, other than the crazy amount of research I do, and I'll tell you how I found out. A buddy sent me a link to a competitor's podcast because he wanted me to hear something. And I listened, and I will say, I was surprised at how much the host made the podcast about themselves. I mean, when I started this podcast, I did want it to be more about me. Well, not really about me, but I wanted to highlight my sense of humor. While I feel dumb saying this aloud, I can be funny at times. In fact, when I launched the podcast, all of my friends thought my sense of humor and storytelling would carry this thing. Then I started recording episodes and getting feedback from you, my listeners, and no one is listening because of my sense of humor. You've made it clear that you listen because you know I'm going to put so much research into each show and that my strange personality is going to come up with some unique questions that will get the guests talking and I'll get information that the other podcasts never will, unless I listen to mine. Once I realized that's the reason that people listen, I decided that while sure, a joke will work here and there, This podcast is about telling the real stories of my guests. I'm not going to interrupt them because my ego wants to share stories of my own. This is someone else's interview, and there's no need to talk about me a whole lot. That was my biggest takeaway from the other podcasts I listened to. They want it to be as important as the guest. Really, the way I do it, the intro is my time to shine. And when I have something I want to share or I have a story I want to tell, that's where I do it. So that means for every hour I record with someone, It's all them telling their story, and I guide them and probe into it here and there. And the other podcast I listened to? I'd say I got to hear just as much from the host as I did the guest. And while I can't say it made me sick to my stomach, it did make me lose interest. That's the last thing I want this show to become. Me talking about me too much. If I start getting diarrhea of the mouth, email me at mikeatthepowellmovement.com and tell me to stop talking about myself. I'll also take any other feedback at that email as well, positive or negative. And I think the feedback this week, part two with Julian Carr, is going to be fantastic. Julian is arguably the most interesting man in the ski industry. And there's no arguing that he goes the biggest these days. It's not even close. And this week, we talk about his biggest and a whole lot more. Before we get into it, I want to ask you to rate and review the show wherever you listen. It really does help the show grow. So does telling your like-minded friends about the podcast. And before I forget, I should also thank Josh Lubeck here for sending me a shipment of NEMA vitamins. They gave me the energy to lose 40 pounds a couple years ago, and I've managed to keep 35 of those 40 pounds off with the help of NEMA. If you want to lose some weight or you just want some energy to work out or get through your day, head on over to nemabrand.com. Go shopping. When you check out, enter the code POWELL15. That's all one word, no spaces, and you'll get 15% off. Last but not least, I only work with the best brands in the business, and to keep the show going, I need you to support them. Those brands are Best Day Brewing. Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, Rollerblade, Elon Skis, Stanley, and High Cascade Snowboard Camp. Now, it's time for part two with Julian Carr. I'm going to start this thing out with your hair, and it has nothing to do with your hair length. I heard that your hair can tell the story of a night through indicator strands. Like when you get shark-eyed at the bar, your hair strands will loosen up on their own to indicate what was going to happen that night. Do you have any idea what I'm talking about? Well... That's something my buddy Parker Cook came up with. He's like, I can tell what stage we're at in the night by usually your hair is pretty intact. But he's like, when your strands start coming out, get a a little loose, then those are some indicator strands. To It's been a pretty eventful evening. And he liked to say that when two or three strands would loosen up themselves in their ponytail and start to come out, 
That meant that you were ready to dance fight and you would take on just about anyone out there. And, you know, I've heard the term dance fighting before, but what does that actually mean? <laughs> Man, you know, I feel like in the last five to eight years or so, I've, um, I guess you can use the word matured, that <laughs> it's hard for me to still be proud of how rowdy we used to get. But yeah, I mean, you just go out on the dance floor and it's not thrashing or moshing. But it's like getting chesty and, and you're taking up space and, and you're challenging people, but you have a big smile and, and you just want to see if people want to join in that kind of camaraderie. <laughs> and when I think about it, like you and your crew, when you would go out and rage years ago, the Parker Cooks of the world and the Rachel Burks of the world and yourself, I mean, were you guys creating a scene almost wherever you were? <laughs> I mean, we always say that the Peruvian bar at Alta is like one of our favorite opera spots. And I mean, it's like the Wild West in there. And I swear just about every time we'd go in there, we'd end up somehow on the ground wrestling somebody and just people kind of step over us. But Parker and I would usually, I don't know if you'd say make a scene, we would entertain. <laughs> people knew you were there. Oh yeah. It was just all in a good laugh. And somehow it was not a disturbance. It was like added ambience somehow like somehow it all worked or at least i think it wasn't just annoying dudes being idiots i think we had a nice uh, sensibility to our rowdiness and you know when you think about the peruvian bar and people being idiots because i think of that bar and that place is something that every ski bomb should experience because it is like nothing else i've ever experienced and when you think about it being crowded and sweaty and tons of people in there and everybody getting hammered and it's like seven o'clock what's the dumbest shit you've seen someone do in a crowded Peruvian bar. <laughs> oh, man, we used to do social dares where it couldn't be like just some ridiculous dare. So we would be like, hey, you got to go up and that person that's wearing that yellow jacket, you need to be wearing it somehow in the next five minutes. So you have to go up, introduce yourself, somehow get them to let you try in your jacket. And then you come back and it'd be the next person's turn. So anyway, there's a big buffalo head that's hanging up on the wall. And one of the social dares we did, there's a group of people, you know, really busy. They're standing underneath the buffalo head and it's like scruff is hanging down. And our buddy, Andy Harmon, it was his turn. We're like, Andy, you have to go up to that group of people, get into a conversation and mid conversation, you're going to dip his scruff in your beer and then you're going to suck the beer out of the scruff. <laughs> that still takes the cake. Oh man, that's amazing. I can't even imagine just the reaction on those people's faces and just the conversation they had afterwards, like a week later. And like, oh, I'm sure they're still talking about it. It's yeah. Hilarious. Every time I go in there, that's all I can think of, really. It just was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And he nailed it. He just did it with confidence, came back. Next person's turn. Business as usual is amazing. Awesome, man. Well, we started this part out with talking about your hair and your hair is really long, like down to your calves. And at this <laughs> point, I would think sometimes it gets to be a hassle for you. Has your hair ever gotten caught in the gears of a combine or been caught in a blender? Or what's the most ridiculous pain in the ass thing that your hair does? Well, I look at it as it's an extension of your nervous system. And I feel like Native American culture, samurai culture has had similar opinions about long hair. Yeah. And it's not like you need it out to possess those powers. So I've always kept my hair pretty wrapped up and, you know, I use like three rubber bands to keep it all so it's not an issue whatsoever. It kind of feels like I have short hair. But for a couple of years, I actually tried having my hair out skiing. You know, one time in particular, I got just this really bad knot. I thought I was going to have to cut my hair because I just couldn't <laughs> get it out. So I, I was hitting up all my friends that are girls. And I'm like, how do you guys do this? And they're like, well, you have to go in the shower for like an hour with a bottle of shampoo and like a brush and work it out. And I was like, are you kidding me? I'm like, you guys do this frequently? So I did it that one time, and I'm like, oh, I'm never doing that again. So I keep it pretty wrapped up and intact, but that one time I did spend an hour getting a knot out, and I was like, okay, note to self, I'm never skiing with my hair out again. Well, high-maintenance hair right there, although you like to keep it low-maintenance and put away, but we're going to get away from your hair and go back to where we left off. Last time we were talking about big cliffs. We talked about the sick bird one. We talked about Air Jordan. And before we talk about the 210-foot cliff in Switzerland, I have a few questions about Big Air in general, and I remember I was talking with Bryce Phillips about flipping big cliffs on his pontoons back in the day, and I remember him saying something about they're almost too big or almost too fat to backflip, 
and even straight airs almost were a problem because the wind caught them and created issues for them. Did you ever have a problem with drag and wind? Yeah, so the first cliff I ever hit over 100 feet truly was a 175-footer. I did a straight air. I had my center of gravity perfect for about 140 feet of the air. And then for the last 30 feet or so, the wind did grab my skis and it did cause me to start tipping backwards. And I landed more backwards than like I really wanted to, but I landed completely fine, totally safe, skied away like a champ. But I was like, wow, that took away my control factor. And I, I really, it was an uncomfortable feeling. And if I would have lost my center of gravity higher up in the air, when you start to tip back like that, when the wind grabs your skis, it can be catastrophic, really. So that's where I kind of just was like, well, you know, if you do a front flip, you're essentially swan diving through the air. You're slicing through the air and the sky. Your knees are half bent, so your skis are also slicing through. Yeah. So you're not leaving yourself subject to wind grab. So I found that for sure, the technique so that you can maintain control the entire distance is the front flip. Landings are a whole nother animal. And when you hit a ginormous cliff like the ones that you hit, is there a focus spot on your body where you're trying to take all this impact? Well, it happens in milliseconds, but you have to distribute that impact throughout your entire body evenly. And, you know, I don't land a full body at the exact same time. It's like I said, milliseconds, but actually the impact starts, the energy starts shoulder blades, high back, but then in those split seconds, it goes down into my lower back, butt, hamstrings, and actually a lot of the energy from that front flip momentum goes into your skis and boots. And like I said, it's like a non-impact. You're supremely relaxed. And with that technique, not only do you not open yourself up to wind drag, but you also land, you know, in a way that's very cooperative with the angle, the slope, and the deepness, obviously. Does it ever hurt? Yeah, it's a crazy space to explore, but the rule is I will never do it if it's going to hurt. So every single big cliff I've ever done, I've not felt it pretty much. It's been a non-impact. I achieve that kind of state of supreme relaxation, meditation, awareness, presence, and get connected with my environment. And all those hippie things are true. Like when I've read interviews with like monks that talk about where they can take their mind and body just by sitting there, you know, obviously cross-legged, I was like, I know that mental space. I obviously proceed in a way and connect with that mental space in an entirely different parameter, but I am. I'm there, I'm present, and I'm supremely relaxed, and it's my life at stake. So that's the only way I'll do it. So yeah, I've, I've never felt any kind of pain whatsoever on big cliffs. And then after impact, are you still in that zen-like mode of being a charged particle? Or does adrenaline get to you and then you're all amped up and it's almost hard to control your emotions? Oh, man, as soon as I ski away, I get a crazy amount of adrenaline and, you know, totally opposite kind of energy becomes almost overwhelming of just excitement and stoke and snapping out of that kind of crazy state of mind I was in, you know. And that's definitely just as much of a trip of the whole experience. How about after the fact, like telling people about what you did? Because I'm sure you're not the dude who wants to come off as some like jock-like adrenaline junkie. When you get to the bar after the fact, do you tell people at the bar about what you did? Or do you wait and let them hear about it and see the footage and then let them talk to you about it? I've always been of the wheelhouse of show me, don't tell me. Okay. And even if you did have a clip of it, you're not going to show anybody at that point. No, I'm, I'm pretty much someone that likes to act and execute and be productive and let results be visible and those can speak for yourself you know, you know you really don't need to do it i just like to remain humble and really that's why i'm out there i love skiing in all capacities and it's not my identity either so that's an interesting thing i think a lot of athletes or anybody that's in a space like this you have to put so much of yourself into what you're doing to achieve success in such a competitive landscape, such a dangerous landscape that it's hard not to have your identity get wrapped up in it. But I try to remain separated from that because I know that I have a lot more going on in life than just skiing. And when it really comes down to living a long, full life, if you get your identity too wrapped up in that kind of stuff, that can be a problem. So I've always just really been able to compartmentalize and try to be humble and, and realize I just love being in the mountains and that's just a weird-ass activity I like to do, and it's really, really strange. 
So this whole thing doesn't build up any ego or false confidence. It's just what you like to do. Yeah, totally. You know, I've had this incremental comfort zone get bigger and bigger throughout the years and being in the mountains, but I've been in the mountains ever since I was born. Like we talked about earlier, going on big hikes with my dad and just finding like that nice pace of being in the mountains, finding your breath. And I've figured out that I have some fluency and the more time I've spent in the, in the mountains, you know, I've gotten in on mother nature's secret a little bit. And, you know, I feel very privileged. Uh, It's like a big grateful kind of thing that I'm just lucky I'm able to participate and get my mountain man card. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it seems like you figured out how to unlock that cheat code and you're able to go as big as you possibly want. And then another cheat code that a lot of people who do what you do or like to hit big cliffs and like to almost fly, a lot of people graduate or move on to base jumping or skydiving. And I don't think that's something that you've participated in. I'm not 100%, but with the huge cliffs that you do, I would think that would be the next natural progression. Is there any interest in that for you? You know, that's a great thing you brought up. Going back 10 plus years ago, I became buddies with JT Holmes when he was going to school at the University of Utah. We had some classes together and started skateboarding and skiing together. And and he was just starting to skydive. And he had only a couple skydives, I think, under his belt. And he was like, hey, we're going to go up to this bridge in Idaho and base jump. You should come with and do it. So I was like, cool, I'm in. So on the way up, he's telling me all about the body mechanics. He arranged for me to have a parachute up there. So we get up there. We're on the picnic benches, practicing form and sequencing with your body. And I'm getting deep into visualization just like I would on a big cliff. It's really intense, but I do find like a nice comfort level with it. And we're ready to go. So I think JT had like literally one or two skydives under his belt and he's going for the base jump. And there's a couple other of his buddies there that had done it quite a bit. And then me. And we started driving up something in me suddenly it was total clarity and it was like dude the way you go about big cliffs is if you do everything right then everything goes right that's a good equation that you're comfortable with and i'm like wow if i do everything right with base jumping everything can still go wrong because you're putting so much trust into your parachute into the lines not twisting and all these other variables that i can't control And so it was just this instant, total clarity. And I just told everybody, I'm like, hey, guys, I'm out. I'll film you guys. I'll hang out. I'll drive the shuttle. No problem, but I'm not going to do it. And they were obviously focused, and they were like, no problem. So I ended up just filming them and hanging out. But that equation to me, I've never had a comfort level with it ever since that kind of clarity that I had driving up to actually base jump. But I've had very vivid dreams of reenacting pretty much that same environment and actually doing it. And I wake up and I'm like, oh my God, did I base jump? I'm like, oh, it's a dream. (laughs) So I can't imagine how much fun it would be. I mean, it looks incredible, but no, I have zero comfort level or interest in pursuing anything that has to do with the parachute. Because like I said, if I do everything right, it can still go wrong. And I don't like that. No, it's a very interesting way to look at that whole thing. And in just thinking about what you've done, I think you've done over like 100 100 footers. And as you get older, does the level of fear increase or does anything change for you? Fear always stays the same. The fear is always there. I just have gotten a really interesting ability to grab a hold of it and and sit with it and explore it and, and get past it. And I think that's something that is always intense. And just to know that's what I'm going to expect. It's just an intense environment to operate in. But I still love the chase. And obviously, you got to be on snow 100 days a year and be looking at where all the storms are and, you know, be willing to drive or book flights. If you want to hit 60, 70, 80, 100 foot cliffs, you got to put yourself in the right environment where cool things can happen. So I'm still just as in love with the chase as ever. And yeah, sometimes that chase is really intense, scary environments that you just have to sit with and understand why you're scared. Can you still proceed? Or, oh, no, I'm scared because this is wrong and I need to get out of here and and move on. And the chase is a lot easier when you have a lot of sponsors supporting you and you have a budget that you can go places. And when I think about the people supporting you, while I'm sure all the brands love the exposure that you're generating through these incredible cliffs, I'm sure no one is pushing you to do this type of shit. Like, you're not getting calls like, hey, Julian, we need another 100-footer this season for the catalog cover. 
Like no one expects <laughs> you to do this stuff. They just love the output that you put out. Yeah, no, you nailed it. Like I've never had pressure from any sponsor. If anything, I've had some sponsors reach out and be like, hey, just so you know, like we are just happy with your productivity each year. Cliffs are cool, but know that we aren't trying to push you in that direction or make you feel like you need to do that. Like just so you know. So it's actually been the exact opposite, which is amazing. Yeah. But when you do nail a giant cliff and the photo is available for purchase, is it something where the photo, like that Switzerland cliff, is the photo worth more because it's so gnarly? Or do photographers pretty much have standard pricing and like that picture is just the same as any other picture? You know, I think the game has changed so much, you know, but when like the Engelberg cliff shot came out, Oscar Enander, a photographer, called me and he's like, hey, Free skier either wants to run it as the cover of their photo annual or Powder said they'd run it just as, you know, one of the main images in their photo annual gallery. Which one do you want? So, you know, I think that era was just a little different when Powder Magazine was just beyond the holy grail to be in the photo annual. So that's what we went with. And I know that Oscar sold that image who knows how many times to other places uh, all over the world globally for those kinds of rights uh, and how he splits that up or when they expire. But editorial and, and commercial, like that's just the whole world that the photographers know their ins and outs. But I always just trust the photographers to, you know, distribute the photography in the best way possible for both of us. So I kind of always just trusted the photographers I was working with to do the right decisions. And, and obviously they have a career. It's, it's their photo. So at the end of the day, I, I kind of try to stay out of it because it was like, I work with them because I trust them to get the shot. And I also work with them because I trust their business model and they know what they're doing. You know, it's a weird business model for you, the athlete, though, because you're risking your life for photos. And while the act of what you're doing is career defining for you, the photographer is the one that's able to monetize. Is that ever strange that you never, ever make any money off of your photos unless they win X Games gold? <laughs> well, the way I look at it is... I'm a professional skier and I have great relationships with some awesome brands and they compensate me because they trust that I'm going to appear in media. And that's just it. Going out and working out with a great photographer and they end up with great photos that end up in magazines. That's my job. So I don't look at it as there's any kind of hard feelings or it's a strange business model because I look at it as it's my job to be in media and the photographer's job is to go get good images and they need to make a living too. So that's their way they make their income. And I make my income by sponsors trusting that I'm going to be in media each year. It's time for my first sponsor break. And Peter Glenn Ski and Sports has been supporting the show for years. And they're your one-stop shop for all of your summer needs. Think inline skates, wakeboards, water skis, bathing suits, footwear, travel wear. Yes, and even though it's summer, Peter Glenn always has the best prices on ski and snowboard gear. And not only do they have all the brands, Peter Glenn has been getting people out there for over 70 years, and their knowledgeable staff will have you dialed with the right gear in-store. And online, they offer a five-star shopping experience, complete with free shipping over $50, a no-hassle return policy, and they will price match reputable dealers. So make sure you check out Peter Glenn before buying from anywhere else. And if anywhere else has a price that looks a little low, we'll price match it over at Peter Glenn so you can come support the show. To check out all the deals, head on over to PeterGlenn.com. Next up is Rollerblade, the brand that invented the sport of inline skating. And no one comes close to the fit, comfort, and performance of a Rollerblade branded inline skate. Whether you're looking for an ultra-supportive hard boot or a soft boot that features support where you need it, Rollerblade has the skate for you. And that's not all they have. For skiers out there, Rollerblade has created an award-winning skate-to-ski app designed to get your legs in shape for ski season or just to keep your ski legs in shape all year round. The app makes staying in shape fun, it's free, and it's available wherever you get your apps. And really, I can't say this enough about the sport of inline skating. Save your knees from running, save your bank account from biking, and pick up a pair of Rollerblade branded inline skates. Find all about all the skates, pads, and everything else over at rollerblade.com. Whether you're skiing, skating, biking, hiking, running at the skate park, doing yard work, or whatever, my next sponsor is the best way to celebrate a great workout or a great time without slowing you down. I'm talking about the best tasting non-alcoholic beer on the market, Best Day Brewing. 2023 is the year of the non-alcoholic drink. And for doers like you and me, midday beers don't cut it anymore. 
We've got to go out and pick up the kids, run errands, and go out and have more fun. And the safe and responsible way to do this is by not drinking alcohol. And you know what? Another thing I found myself doing with Best Day is that when I am drinking alcoholic beverages, I'll mix in a couple Best Days so I don't get too drunk and I can have fun all night. It's like I still feel like I'm partying because I am, but I'm only drinking like 60 calories instead of 300. It's amazing. Next time you're at the store, do what I've been doing and pick up a six pack of Best Day. My favorite flavor is the full bodied hazy IPA. And I'd be curious to see what you like best. So when you pick up a six pack, drink it and then shoot me an email at mike at the to let me know what you think about your new beer. To find out more about all things Best Day, head on over to bestdaybrewing.com. Those are my sponsors this break. Now it's time to jump back into the podcast. In 2019, you wanted the X Games gold medal for best photo award. And do they announce that at the X Games? And are you there to take it all in and feel like an X Games gold medalist? It was pretty crazy because Adam Barker told me that we'd been selected as the only U.S. finalist of like, you know, seven or eight photos and all the other photographers and athletes were based on different places on the planet. And I was like, that's kind of cool. Sure, man. Sounds cool. And then as the date approached, the X Games did so much cool stuff with it and had huge blown up images all over the X Games village in Aspen. And then they did a live TV announcement of who won. And the more it all actually happened, it was an amazing experience. It actually overwhelmed me in the sense that I was expecting so little. I just thought it would be like, oh, that's kind of cool. And then it ended up being like a pretty big deal. And yeah, we got paid pretty fat and we each got our X Games gold medal too. So that was a pretty cool experience because obviously big mountain skiing, cliffs, you know, it's not really an environment that you know, slope style, big air, half pipe, all that kind of stuff. It's, it's just a different spectrum. So to suddenly get a taste of that was pretty cool. It was pretty unique and definitely grateful that we, we got it. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. And I'm glad to hear that you got paid for that one. And if you've listened to my podcast before, which I think you have, you know, I like to talk about money. So we'll speak about money and sponsorship. And you've had a ton of sponsors over the years. First and foremost, who are the brands that sponsor you today? Right now, my alignment with brands is Rab Outerwear, Icelandic Skis, Onyx Maps, Gordini Gloves and Goggles, De La Boot Boots, Leaky Poles, and Ford Bronco. Those are what I got going right now. And that's right now, and those are all amazing brands. And you've always had a lot of sponsors. You've done a really good job with that. And when you think about the window of where you did the best during your ski career, what was that window? Can you think of like a couple years where you were doing the best? I'd say that I've hit a pretty consistent level that I've been able to maintain for the past 10 plus years. And I think it's because I don't think I ever got greedy. I think I realize that I'm a very fortunate person. And I think I've always felt like I have over delivered and done a very good job with delivering metrics to my sponsors throughout the years. So I think they've just been very happy to renew with me. And I never asked for an increase. And I think Throughout some of the years, 10 years ago, I could have been asking for increases for sure. But I was like, you know what? I'm doing great. I want to maintain these relationships and just maintain this nice, level, steady, comfortable living that I'm very fortunate and lucky to even have. Um, So that's been my perspective and things have remained awesome and and consistent for 10 plus years. So over the past 10 plus years, is it safe to say that you've pulled in a million dollars from skiing? Oh, that's a good question. I would say my entire career, I'd have to be around that number. Yeah. So that's awesome. So you've been doing well as a pro skier. You have other stuff going on as well in the background, but we're talking about your pro ski money. And then I'm sure on top of just the pro ski money, you're getting another 20 to 30 K combined in travel budget. And when you have a travel budget, do you have to pay for everything up front and then submit receipts? Yeah, usually that's the way it works. Well, actually I should say... I was able to turn, you know, photo incentives and travel budget just into one annual payment schedule that they knew I'd be using the money to compensate myself and travel. So, yeah, but when I did have specific travel budget type stuff, you'd kind of have to prove what project you were looking at with a tentative budget. They'd approve it. And then in the end of the year or after the trip or quarterly, you'd submit your receipts in a pretty organized manner to get reimbursed. It was always in a reimburse type of thing. In photo incentives, I was always maxing them out. So I just got to the point where, you know, I was comfortable saying, hey, let's enable me before the season. Let's get this money 
that I would have made from travel budget and photo instead of let's just prepay that way I'm enabled, I have options, and it just kind of streamlines my year and, and lets me do my job better. And it makes everything turnkey for everybody. You don't have to worry about waiting on checks and waiting on different things, which makes yeah. things easier. Yeah. And I get why brands do that because I think some people, you know, they kind of get a, a feel for how professional they are. If they can even manage a budget or meet a budget or submit a proposal or get their expenses together, spend in a responsible manner. Uh, and, and what's the end product? You know, like what kind of photo incentives are you hitting? What kind of media are you going to be in? Are you actually maxing out your schedule? You know, so I think, you know, like I said, I was happy to do that for a few years. And once I kind of demonstrated I could be proficient, it was not that hard to convert everything to kind of have it all happen ahead of time. Okay. And I'd say one of the hardest things in these sports is getting broken up with. Looking at your career, you're on Rab right now. You're on Spider though for 15 years, which is an incredible run with the brand. What's the breakup like with a brand when you've been with them that long? Oh, yeah. So I was with Spider for 18 years. I was our longest tenured athlete. And I have nothing but great things to say about Spider. And it was amicable. I had an opportunity with Rab that not only is their ski gear amazing, that they're getting into that space. They're historically a mountaineering brand and they're starting up a ski line. And they're also big into mountain running and they wanted to be a part of the Cirque series in a major way. So for a year round fit, Rab just made a ton of sense. So it was really interesting to assess a relationship like I'd had with Spider for so long that it had treated me so well through all the ups and downs to realize that, you know, from a professional perspective, it was a no brainer that Rab was a great direction to go. So I was able to call up Spider, have an awesome conversation with actually the only person in that organization that was there when I got there. Me and him were the last two from when I first came on and we get along really well. So we had a great conversation and he's like, well, is there anything I can do to match or, or make this work? And I was like, you know, it's just this year round thing that makes a ton of sense for everything I got going on in my life. And he's like, well, cool, man. I wish you the best. And I'm like, totally, man. Likewise. That's awesome. And the yeah. last sponsor I want to talk about is Icelandic. And they're so interesting to me because they've been around and quietly successful since 2005. But I really, I don't know anything about them. Like with Elan, I can tell you that they make incredible skis at the most state-of-the-art factory in the world. But with Icelandic, <laughs> I know they've been around forever. They have a concert around the trade show that's incredible. They have you and little Scotty. And that's all I really know about the brand. I don't really see them on the mountain that much. But they've been successful. They're around. Tell me more about the brand and how they're able to seemingly thrive in the ski industry. Well, what's interesting is they've been quietly going up the ladder on most skis produced by ski company. More than Fisher. I don't want to speak out of turn here, but they're up there. They're like number seven. Wow. And they do really well. And they make all their skis out of the Never Summer factory in Denver. And, you know, I've visited a couple of the factories over in Europe. Over the years, and I was able to tour the Icelandic one a couple of times. And historically, from what I've seen, most major ski makers over in Europe, they have these points of inspection and ensure the craftsmanship is amazing. Usually there's like 15 or 20 points of inspection. And anyone that snowboards knows that never summer snowboards are indestructible. And it's the exact same thing with Icelandic skis. They're indestructible. And they have, I think it's around 50 points of inspection at this facility in Denver. And... I would break at least one or two skis a year, if not blow out lots of edges prior to getting on Icelandic. And in my like eight or nine years with Icelandic, not only have I never broke a ski, I have never blown out an edge, which is unbelievable because I would blow out edges like it was going out of style. And at least a few times a year, I'll hit something and I'm like, well, it was a good run. Definitely blew out an edge on that one. And I'll rip off my ski and just a bunch of P-Tex is gone. The edge is still sitting there. So Icelandic has an amazing core group of people that kicked that company off from Ben Anderson, Annalisa Lovely, Ashley Hart, Sam Warren, Travis Parr, and some of these core athletes that have been around forever, like Mark Morris, that are just these staples to the Colorado community. And if you go to any ski resort in Colorado, Icelandic's pretty overwhelming, but I think they've done a great job with global distribution and expanding into other key ski regions in the U.S. So Massive shout out to the Icelandic family. Amazing, amazing people run that company. Amazing, indestructible skis. Well, that's Icelandic. And while I'm at it, I might as well talk about Discreet. This is a company that you built for over 15 years, and it seemed like things were continuing to build. What made you think about selling your baby? 
You know, I think I just gotten a little disenfranchised as the business model evolved and things became so digital strategy priority. And I, you know, had started the Cirque Series races and and saw a lot of success. And I, I loved every aspect of producing races. And they were having a lot of success. So I, I realized I was in a position that there's still a lot of brand equity and value in Discrete. And that the interest level I had and the passion that I had had for 15 years to operate Discrete I realized that I was ready to move into a different direction and put all my energy into into Cirque Series and skiing and just have more bandwidth in general. And so I started shopping it around and had some pretty killer groups that were interested and was able to find an awesome buyer. So yeah, started that sucker in like 2004 or so and sold it in 2019. So right before the pandemic hits is when you sell it? Yeah, timing was pretty crazy. Yeah, the time is crazy, and I guess you make a pretty good profit when you sell the brand. I mean, do you do well? Yeah, I was stoked. I never was making a ton of money from Discreet. I was able to pay my employees and pay myself a little bit, but it was always just a grind and always a constant learning process. But it was this invaluable education of how to run a business. So when I cooked up the idea of Cirque Series, I knew exactly what I wanted to achieve, and I knew exactly how to do it. So I was able to execute Cirque Series in a manner that I was able to find success pretty quickly. And it's been incredible to see Cirque Series do so well. And I know for a fact, if I wouldn't have had Discreet, I would have not had the chops or the know-how or the ability to navigate starting up such a successful race series out of nowhere. So no, I didn't become rich from the sale of Discreet, nor was I rich from running it, but it was a invaluable education. And I I was able to pay myself throughout the years, not much. And I was able to sell it, not for a ton of money, but some money. And Discrete should have been positioned to do some big things during the pandemic, because at that point, a big product line was neck gaiters, I felt like. They were acceptable to be worn as masks, especially that first year. But it didn't seem like Discrete made the right pivot. Why couldn't the new owners make that work and become bigger during the pandemic years? Well, actually, it was interesting because the kind of neck gaiters that obviously we make uh, or that Discreet makes are the kind of neck gaiters that there's actually all these articles that came out early COVID that showed that those particular kind of neck gaiters, like the ones you use when you're out skiing, that are like that thin kind of tech polyester material, were ineffective (laughs) for COVID. Yeah. So there's all these articles and it was actually bullshit. It was all just speculation. And ended up that they worked just fine. So I think that really hurt any kind of potential there was there because I think they were selling a lot of them for a moment. And then that became like the overwhelming consensus that those were ineffective. And where is the brand today? The current owner, just like three or four months ago, hit me up and was like, hey, just letting you know, I got a bunch of other coals in the fire. And he's like, I'm going to discontinue operating discreet. So it shut down three or four months ago. Oh, man. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, but I'm glad you were able to get the learning experience you did. And now I'm going to take us all the way back to where when we were starting the podcast, we were talking about the big cliff in Ingleberg. We didn't talk about it back then, but the cliff is a crazy one. I mean, there are so many different factors to this one, just getting into this cliff that you didn't have to experience getting into the ones of the past. So what are the things that you're up against just getting into this cliff that make it more challenging than anything else you've ever done? Yeah, this cliff... Usually, you know, when you do a big cliff, I like to get into the takeoff and smooth it out. And just like someone building a kicker can really get things dialed for the takeoff so there's no surprises, right? And obviously, when you're skiing the big mountain and hitting cliffs, there's such an environment that sometimes you just have to hit things natural and you can't go down and smooth them out. And certainly, probably more cliffs I've hit my entire life have been natural than ones I've had to go in and prep the takeoff right and make sense of it but with big cliffs that's usually the preferred route is to go in and make sense of it so anyway this one in engelberg it was a very interesting takeoff zone that you had to ski through some pretty technical steep exposed terrain to get to the takeoff so while i was mesmerized looking at this cliff for a couple of weeks my first trip ever to europe we did two weeks in austria then we went over to engelberg and did two weeks there and it was deep we're hitting 40 footers, 50 footers, and this cliff is up totally inbounds. And you actually go across this chairlift that goes over a lake 
to access the upper part of the mountain on the right side of the ski resort. The left side of the ski resort is where the titless tram is, and on the right side is where a bunch of chairlifts are, and there's this amazing high alpine terrain. But to access that right side of the mountain, you go across this chairlift that goes over a lake, and you're literally just staring at the cliff. It's right there in front of you. So obviously this entire time I'm in Engelberg, I'm just looking at this cliff like daydreaming. Mm -hmm. And I actually go and like probe the landing and it's not quite there. And I start looking at like the horizon points for like, okay, well, when I'm up there, if I'm up there, I know I need to aim for that landmark on the horizon because that's where this landing is that makes sense. So I was already like going through all those mechanics, but it was all fantasy. But that's what I mean. That's what it takes to put yourself in those environments and to be interested. You got to put in the work. So I knew that just for any 1% chance I could hit that cliff, I needed to put in some work throughout those two weeks that I was there. And I did. And then same thing as Air Jordan, the last two days we're in town, big storm comes in, they close the whole upper mountain. And again, the last day we're filming for, I was with Rage Films on this trip and just met Oscar Enander. And he shot like Jamie Pierre's awesome, like 100 60 foot cliff that was up just around the corner in Engelberg the year before when Pierre went there and teed off on everything. And so I'm just having a blast. We're getting tons of good images, shooting tons of great pow, hitting a bunch of smaller cliffs. Things are going great. And then this huge storm comes in. And sure enough, you know, I can see stars in the sky the night before we go to bed to wake up the next morning to head out. And we wake up, total bluebird. And I just knew I was going to go straight for that cliff. And we all go into where you load these gondolas, you know, when everyone has their big backpacks and all this, it's kind of crazy. Anyway, I end up in a gondola by myself, which is interesting. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going up and all the gondolas are plain. There's no art on them. And I got in the one gondola. I look and there's this big piece of art on it and it's a giant eagle. <laughs> huh. I was like, huh, this is kind of a cool omen. So I go up, I'm able to have some time to myself, and the only freaking gondola has art on it, and there's an eagle on it. It's amazing. And, you know, I'm feeling, by then, a lot of fear, a lot of intense energy, but I'm, like, very determined to go face that fear and, and have a look at this cliff. The biggest thing you've ever hit. Oh, yeah. So the biggest cliff I'd hit up to that point was 175 feet. I'd done probably six or seven cliffs in the 140 to 160 range. But the biggest one I'd done was 175 feet. And I thought this cliff was around 175 feet. So anyway, I go up there and I'm looking at the landing of probe. I mean, it's just stupid deep. There's no question about it. So I go up and I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit it. <laughs> and so I go up and like I said, it's this blind rollover that you have to navigate this really intense, drawn out right hand traverse above a different cliff that's above the takeoff area for my cliff. So I have to go above this cliff, make this drawn out right hand turn that if anything goes wrong, I'm off to the right now and I'm above lethal exposure. I'd never breathed so intently in my life and I had to make one turn once I got far out enough to the right to get back, traverse back underneath the cliff I was just above to get to my takeoff. Okay. And it was so intense making that one turn. Made the turn, and then I got over into where my takeoff area was. And I had never been so happy to see a takeoff in my life because I was like, get me out of here because <laughs> it was so scary to be in that environment making my turns to get down to my takeoff so by the time i got anywhere near my takeoff i was like sweet i'm out of here so i see my horizon point when i make my first last two or three turns before i point it get my trajectory right for where i want to aim and then as soon as i pop out into the sky the ground is just significantly further away than i've ever seen it before <laughs> and i was like holy shit like I am so much higher than that 175 foot cliff. And I'm like, this is rowdy. I'm like, okay, here we go. Like, if you're ever going to be relaxed in your entire life, like your life depends on it, it is right now. So I had this intense self dialogue going on 
while obviously looking at how far away the ground was and realizing I was, you know, 40, 50 feet higher than I'd ever been before. And it was just an eternity in those like four seconds I was in the air. I can still relive the experience vividly because it transcended time. Like it was literally an eternity in a moment. And yeah, I landed, ski popped off. Nick Greener was there, placed up higher so he could ski straight to me in case I got plugged. And I should say that all this fluff that I had created from skiing down, that was one of the craziest things about getting into the air on that cliff was that I got off the cliff and aimed a little left and all the natural trajectory of the slough was funneling just to the skier's right of my takeoff and actually going a little bit right. And that was all planned as well and what I expected and anticipated. But it was crazy because in the air and even in the photo, it looked like an avalanche was coming off the cliff with me. Yeah. Uh, but it was just so much slough that I'd created and I skied it all obviously in one fluid motion. So all that slough was very active. And so to see the cascading snow that looked like an avalanche, also a part of that vision that I had when I came off the cliff and saw how far away the ground was, I also saw what looked like the avalanche of slough in the sky with me. So it was just an unbelievable experience that humans should not ever experience. Like I just, it was so unique, so bizarre so impossible like it's just crazy that i was able to be in the right place to do it the conditions permitted and i i had that interest level and it all worked out and to have that memory bank certainly carries over into the way i can conduct myself the rest of my life it's just like a trump card in the back of my pocket i can pull out anytime i want to be like i've had some life experiences my man <laughs> i'm good here it's time for my final sponsor break and I'm going to start with the award-winning Elan ski brand. I've been telling you about how amazing my ripsticks are and how the whole Elan collection will make you a better skier and how they won more awards than almost any ski brand out last year. Elan truly makes a better ski and their new Playmaker series are worth looking into, especially if you've been waiting for a twin tip from Elan. It's here, and trust me, it's just as fun as my ripstick. And to tell you the truth, I'm lucky to have Elan supporting the podcast this summer. Alon doesn't need to support snowboard or summer episodes, but they support this show because they believe you need to hear the best content in snow and they want to support me. So I'm asking you, when you're looking for skis next year, give Alon a try and I guarantee you're going to become a believer. There's a reason why Alon's building a cult following in the States and once you get on a pair of their skis, you'll realize why. They'll make you a better skier. To find out more about all things Alon, head on over to alonskis.com. Next up, it's Stanley. And summer is finally here, and if you're like me, you like to get outside and go camping, paddleboarding, head to the beach, go adventuring. And to do all of that like a pro, I highly recommend heading over to Stanley1913.com. There, you're going to find all of your camping and adventure needs, along with that iconic water bottle that keeps your water ice cold and your coffee piping hot for hours longer than the competition. Stanley invented the category of keeping things hot and cold over 100 years ago, and they continue to innovate. And since I want you to have the best, I'm going to save you 30% on all Stanley products. All you need to do is head on over to Stanley1913.com, go shopping, and when you check out, use the code PMOVEMENT, that's all one word, all lowercase, and you'll get the best deal you find for Stanley on the internet. My final sponsor this round is High Cascade Snowboard Camp. If you really consider yourself a great parent, you'll give the gift of summer snowboarding to your kid. This is your excuse to get the kids out of your hair and onto the Timberline Glacier at Mount Hood. Instead of having to plan the day for your kids, they'll have a plan of hot lapping top to bottom chairlift rides on real snow. They'll be getting expert coaching and making memories that are going to last a lifetime. If you want your kid to love you, you'll send him or her to Arbor Snowboard's signature session. The dates are July 23rd to July 29th, and your kid will learn to shred from pros like Eric Leon, Mary Rand, Hayden Tyler, Steffi Luxton, Mike Lydell, and Estelle Pensaro. It really is a life-changing experience that your kid will thank you for forever. And if you don't want to hook your kid up or you don't have a kid, don't forget about the adult camp. It's the perfect mix of expert coaching and adult activities. So treat yourself and come be a kid again this summer at High Cascade Snowboard Camp. You can find all about the kids and adult camps over at highcascade.com. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. I'm sure there's people, especially in this day of social media, there's people that probably go onto your page and flip you shit like, hey, 
yeah, you hit that cliff, but you didn't land it and you didn't attempt to land it. Do you get that from people at all? Oh, I mean, every time a photo is posted or a reel is posted or any kind of video, you know, I think of the 100 people that's fired up. There's at uh, least one person that's like, typical skier landing doesn't count. So lame. And, <laughs> you know, for those type of people, I understand, like, we're in an era of action sports where you want to see Travis Pastrana do a double backflip on his motorcycle and stick the shit out of it. And unfortunately, with big cliffs, that's not the outcome that's possible. And that's fine. I'm totally comfortable with it. For me, the experience of doing it safely, landing in a way that I've had a two-decade career of hitting big cliffs and doing it safely is obviously the priority. And, you know, if I can keep it fluid and get my skis back underneath me and ski away in a fluid motion. That's just this huge bonus. But for the people that just completely have that opinion, you know, I respect it. But I always just say, my man, let's have this conversation on the takeoff. <laughs> like, just put yourself in that environment and then think about that perspective and let's have that conversation on the takeoff. And I, I guarantee you, any of those people come to the takeoff or people are like, you know, death wish, you're going to hurt yourself or, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, yeah, you would. You would die because you'd do it wrong. You'd land wrong. You'd be tensed up. And for you, it is a death wish. But for me, I've had this lifelong pursuit of cracking this code. And it's a, a passion thing for me. It's a love thing. It's an act of artistry. So, you know, I have such a comfortable relationship with the strange thing I like to do that those people, it shows me their cards. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's just part of what it is. And I get it. Like you want to see someone stomp. And, and unfortunately, that's not in the cards for big ass cliffs, you know? And, and some people that say that, I'm like, hey, the cliff's just sitting there, buddy. Come show me how it's done. <laughs> well, I feel like the human body's not made to handle that kind of impact. And the way that you're able to do it defies what the human body's able to handle. And it's because you're able to get yourself into that zen-like state. And it's amazing to see what you're able to do. We could talk about it forever, but I'm going to move on to some other stuff. You had brought up the Cirque series, and I know your mom was in event production, and then you interned at MSI. So it makes sense that the next thing that you're going to do is going to create an event series. And this is the first of its kind trail running, mountain running event series in the country. And when you do something like that, and it's been going on for seven years, that means it's been impacted by the pandemic. And I'm guessing that with the Cirque Series, you're spending half of your winter now planning the summer of the Cirque Series. And when the pandemic comes along, does that throw a kink in all of your plans? Like everything's screwed because events are done? Yeah, that was a tough one. My first thing I did was I completely reorganized the entire race schedule to be shifted back two months. And to get aligned with... All the moving parts that make a race happen from staff, EMTs, medics, sponsors, media, you know, the runners themselves. It's a massive coordination. So to move the entire schedule back two months was a huge undertaking, but that's kind of early part of the pandemic when we thought everything would just kind of smooth over after a couple months. So you created all this work for yourself and then had to cancel it all again? <laughs> yeah. Yep. So obviously as things progressed... We had to cancel the entire season. And it was crazy because we were like in our, let's see, that would have been like our fourth year. And we were just starting to sell out races and had so much momentum. So that was just like this really interesting roadblock, major, major speed bump. It was kind of intense, you know, because it was working so well. And then to have something you know, they could never predict like a freaking global pandemic coming and have to cancel our entire race season. Who knows? It was like, are we going to have to cancel all of next year too? And so it was just this huge mystery cloud. So that was very stressful. But as things smoothed out and we figured out how to conduct the races the next year, I had to jump through a lot more hoops, obviously, to do it. But we sold out all our races the very next year. So we had so much momentum going and people loved the races enough that it was an intense roadblock. But it was only momentary. This thing's back on and it's been going back on since the pandemic ended and events were able to come back to the table. This summer, I think you have eight events. How close are they to selling out? We will sell out all our races this summer. 
we did it all last year and the year before too. How many people does that mean that will be part of your event series this summer? Grand total will be over 3,500 runners. Oh, that's incredible, man. So you're creating a, a really cool venue for people that they're not going to find anywhere else in this country. But when the pandemic happened and everything shut down for your event series is where one of the cooler things that you've done happens. And it's expected that you're going to do something else because when you look at your life, you're always doing something else and it's always something next. And the next thing for you is Blake's Broncos, which is rad. Your first car was one of the big Broncos and your new business becomes you're going to buy those big classic Broncos, make them like new again and sell them. What's the best flip story you've had so far? So that was the silver lining from... All the races getting canceled, I suddenly had a whole summer to, you know, have free time, essentially, because I'm so occupied. I'm at full capacity the entire summer to be a successful race director and to put the energy into producing these races that they need justice to be as badass as they are. But it was right around when Ford Bronco announced they're coming out with their new Bronco. And yeah, my first car I had when I was 16 years old, I got a 1978 Bronco. and That's just been my favorite vehicle my entire life and i was like man i should get another 78 or 79 bronco you know one that's kind of maybe in rough shape i can just have and work on and i was very interested in getting one so i just did a deep dive on all things classic broncos that's all i did for like a couple of weeks was just nerd out on the bronco scene and check out what was going on and yeah i i found a candidate vehicle after a few weeks of scouring, and it was over budget, but it was underpriced. And I made it happen. I was like, if I get this at that point, my perspective changed to this is an investment. Because I was like, I, I know enough about this industry now that this price I can get this thing for, even though it's over budget, I know I can turn around and sell it for at least what I bought it for anytime I want, if not a nice uptick. So I buy it and I start nerding out even more, learning about like, factory report cards and which ones came with like interesting factory options that make them more valuable and different stripe and like decal paint packages and stuff that made them even more rare and things that were a telltale sign if you have a truck that did have stripes it was like the bezels are black or the grills black or the rear view mirrors are black or just like certain things meant that it was a, a more rare version and obviously throughout the years you know people repaint them or put on different side mirrors or new bezels or whatever. So it's like a big mystery that even if you see those telltale signs, it doesn't necessarily mean it was one of those rare vehicles because someone's repainted it. You have no idea. So I started realizing you could order same day factory report cards with the VIN number. So I looked up the VIN of this over budget Bronco I got for an underpriced dollar amount. And sure enough, I get the factory report card and it's like, really rare. It has these three things going on that make it really rare. It was a chromatic striped Bronco, which means I had like this orange fade decal on a black truck because it still was a black truck, beautiful black truck, flawless paint, needed work in the engine, needed some work in the interior, but exterior was great. So I learned that it has these chromatic stripes. And then they have this other thing. It's called a freewheeling edition, which is also more rare. And it was a trailer special. Obviously, these are just foreign terms, but if you have all three, if you even have one of the three, it makes your truck more valuable. So I had all three. So I slowly start bringing this truck back to original throughout that whole summer of COVID and into the fall. And as I do this, I keep getting offers for this Bronco for substantially more than I'd put into it. And I enjoyed it. I enjoyed every little bit of it. So I was like, you know what? I just kept scouring and I, I kept realizing I could do this with more Broncos just like I had with this first one I'd got. So I did. I started grabbing more Broncos, figuring out that they're a rare version, and then bringing them back to original. So since COVID, 2020, I guess we're three years into it, or two years, I don't know what we are, but you know, I'm on my 12th 78, 79 Bronco restoration right now and working on two currently. But yeah, I've successfully found and put the work in on 10 Broncos over the last three years. So it's like this cool, you know, I call it a hobby business, but you know, I take it seriously. It's just fun that I can be on my schedule and I can be working on these projects year round, no matter how busy I am with skiing or Cirque Series. It's like this really fun side thing I can have going on and it's a blast. I'm even a co-host of a national Bronco show. I met the host at a national Bronco 
event where you come and show your trucks off. And I ended up winning that event with my first one that I got because I got it all restored, won the second gen category, met a bunch of amazing people and ended up becoming, you know, a co-host on a national broadcast. And my nickname in the whole scene, I've always had this thing where your like porn name is your middle name with the first car you've ever had. So my poor name is Blake Bronco. So my Instagram for my Bronco business, Blake Bronco, that's what I named it, blakebroncos.com. And in that space, I'm just Blake Bronco. So it's so fun cruising around at Bronco shows now and on the podcast, I'm Blake Bronco. So it's like really fun having this kind of anonymous identity, I guess, that's so removed from the outdoor industry, which I obviously exist in for skiing and Cirque Series too. So it's such a fun side thing I got going on. I found a lot of passion for. And even from that first Bronco show I went to where I was able to make those contacts to be the co-host for the National Bronco podcast, I also met Ford there. And that led to the sponsorship with Ford Bronco in general. So yeah, huge silver lining by having the races canceled. I was able to open up this whole forgotten love I had for Ford Bronco. Oh, man, that is pretty cool. And while I'll say the new Broncos look nice, but the ones that you restore with those 70s colorways and striping, they are so incredible looking. I love them so much. There's one down the street from my house that I know I sent you a picture of a few years back, and I've talked to those people. When they're ready to sell, I'm going to make sure they sell it to you. It's one of the blue and white ones. But that's it for part two of our podcast. But as you know, I end everything with inappropriate questions. And this week, I was able to get another really good friend of yours to ask the questions. Parker Cook is not only a talented skier, but he's one of the most talented designers and metal fabricators and artists I know. He used to post a shit ton of pictures on the internet showing his incredible metal work, but he's super shy when it comes to showing off his work. He hasn't been showing it because he feels like he's showing off, and I feel like he should show his work to the public, but whatever, we're not here to talk about Parker Cook. We're here to hear his inappropriate questions, and are you ready for inappropriate question number one from your good buddy Parker? Oh, man, I guess I have no choice. Let's do it. All right. Can you name all of the drinks that we invented at the Sitzmark and the Peruvian? And there are, I think, at least eight. So I need you not to only name them. I want you to also tell me what's in them. We all know the Twisty, and I'll end with the Omaha to give you a little bit of some juice to get it done. So you don't need to name all six of those (laughs) drinks that he's talking about, but the drink other than the Twisky and other than the Omaha, the one or two drinks that really will make our listeners' stomachs either turn or make them want to go make that drink right now, what are those drinks that we're talking about? Well, the most success we found was we created the Boomerang. And the Boomerang is their classic, like, hot cider with cinnamon clove that they have at the sits market out there, but add to whiskey. Seems pretty natural and actually tastes amazing. So if you serve the boomerang, it has to have an orange slice and the cinnamon clove. So whatever bartender happens to give you the boomerang, if it's missing the orange, that's a way steep. And if they give it to you and it has the orange, but it's missing the cinnamon clove, that's a waist deep. And we have more names if it's served on the rocks that go on and on that become six different versions of the boomerang. But it's hugely important that you know the difference. Uh, So anyway, boomerang, way steep, way steep, Omaha, etc. And then when you think about the bars at Alta and you're thinking about the Peruvian and the Sitzmark, it sounded like earlier that you're a Peruvian guy. But then I hear about all these drinks that you're naming at the Sitzmark. I mean, do you lean one way or the other, or are you right down the middle? I mean, I've always said, like, my happy place is, you know, after amazing pow day, beautiful sunset, you got the window seat looking down canyon and the sits mark, close friends, quaint setting, not rowdy. That's my happy place, sits mark alta, after amazing pow day, having a boomerang with some good friends. All right, so now we will jump into question number two. All right, this dude... Julian is a prolific, would you rather campfire son of a gun? And most would you rathers get pretty dirty. So I'm going to tell you what Julian taught would you rather. Would you rather know every word in the encyclopedia 
and the definition of every word in the encyclopedia? Or would you rather have a top black hat CIA agent take you into a secret bunker and tell you all about aliens, crop circles, moon landing, and space travel? Julian, that's for you, my friend. Crop circles or encyclopedia? Uh, Parker's one of a kind. So here's the thing. One of my usual would you rathers is would you rather have the knowledge of every word in the dictionary, like the true knowledge, like actually understand and comprehend every single word in the English dictionary or have someone hand you a million dollars. And I've always been of the opinion, no brainer that you choose the knowledge of the words, because if you have that deep level of understanding of every single word in the dictionary, you're going to have just this insane, comprehensive understanding of how the world operates and have these amazing insights that would be impossible for any human to ever have with that kind of knowledge. But he just asked the one thing that I would actually choose over every word in the dictionary because the galaxy and the cosmos and other life forms out there, that is a mystery. That's not in the encyclopedia. So I would choose the knowledge and a glimpse behind the curtain of what we don't know rather than knowing everything of what we do know. All right. So a great question right there. I didn't know it was going to turn out that great, but it did. So nice work there by Parker Cook. Here comes his final inappropriate question. Okay. This one is almost like I have to admit something that had happened on a beach party trip, but can you elaborate on the disappearing of the left side of your mustache? on the PCH Highway, gutter nap, pizza crumbs, street rat. That's all I'm giving you. <laughs> okay, so for a few years there, our other buddy, Walker Willie, Parker's cousin, another good friend of ours, we'd go on annual trips. Uh, I mean, we still go to Target each year with all our college buddies every year. So Walker Willie's one of my best friends. What a name, Walker Willie. Yeah, right? Walker Willie, that is his name. Not even a nickname. That's the real thing. Crazy. Yeah, he actually podiumed a free ski world tour event in, I want to say Telluride or Durango or Taos. I can't remember which one, but he was up there with like Gunner and Cliff Bennett, like even Walker Willie. So he's just one of the badasses that I cut my teeth with throughout those formative college years. Him, Parker, myself, and our other buddy Tyler Knowles were like a four pack, just ripping every day, Snowbird Alta. But anyway, going back to early college, we would go to San Diego too at the time. We'd always find a way to get out there at least once or twice a year. Walker had this amazing condo right on the beach there somewhere in like La Jolla or Pacific Beach or something like that. And we're out just, you know, doing our thing. And I decided I was tired and, and needed to get out of the bar for a minute and find a comfortable place to chill out. So they come out and they find me like tucked away getting some Z's outside of the bar. And, you know, I had my cool guy mustache at the time and somehow a little bit got rubbed off that they are the opinion that something must have chewed it off while I was sitting there chilling <laughs> for a half hour. So. But yeah, I don't know. Uh, I love that Parker can bring up some of the finer moments. Uh, but yeah, nice one, Parker. Well, it sounds like when he said that he had to sell himself out that he may have shaved it off himself and maybe you found something out there. Because he said he had to tell oh, a secret. Oh, is that what he said? Yeah. Because I was always like, no, that's impossible. Oh, the secret's out. I mean, I knew it was something like that. Well, glad that mystery's solved. There we go. The Powell Movement uncovering one mystery at a time while my French bulldog barks uncontrollably in the podcast. But that is the end of the podcast. And Julian, you seem to have figured it all out. And at the end of the day, when you look at your baseball card, the stats are going to list the 140-foot contest invert record, the 210-foot cliff invert record, your X Games gold medal, your Mallory Award, your Sick Bird Award, Powder Awards. The card is also going to list the companies you've owned and the Cirque Series you created. And really, it's because you've always been a go-getter. You don't wait for shit to happen. You make shit happen. And with your talent, your brains, and your drive combined with the fact that it could be impossible for you to sit back and not do anything, it's going to be interesting to see what you do next. Your story's a cool one, and I thank you for your time, my man. Well, yeah, I appreciate the platform. Always an honor to be able to talk about all this stuff. It's pretty cool, and I, I love your podcast, so thanks so much for having me on. So that was part two with Julian Carr, and I've always known he was a really cool, really smart, really driven person. 
What I didn't realize is how thoughtful he is to the approach of everything he does. It's like everything is calculated and everything has a deeper meaning for Julian. He's one of those guys who's never going to fail based on effort. And you know that everything he's a part of is going to be dialed by Julian himself. While I'm sure that one day he'll need to delegate to get things done, the reason he's been so successful is because his fingerprints are on everything. And while that can be a hard thing to juggle, that's a pretty cool thing as well. That's the podcast this week. I want to thank you for listening and again ask you to please rate and review me wherever you do listen. Finally, I want you to support the sponsors who make this thing happen. They are Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, Best Day Brewing, Rollerblade, Elon Skis, Stanley, and the High Cascade Snowboard Camp. Have a great week, everyone.